The World Press Freedom Index has ranked New Zealand 13th in the world. Do you feel like that's a fair representation? In comparison to other countries in the Pacific who are way lower down on the list, we do have a lot more openness and transparency here in New Zealand. However, we have other different issues that do um, impede our you know, media freedom here. Uh, investigative journalism here is not as strong as it should be among Māori and Pacific um, journalists. So we need a lot more stronger reporting in areas where there is um, social injustice or inequality, resource management consents that are being given out that affect many Māori communities around the country. Not enough hard questions get asked about those things. Although we have the Official Information Act here and you're able to request information from government departments, sometimes the information they give you is not exactly relevant to what you want so you have to sort of um, delve deeper into issues these um, issues of racism it's not overt though it's um, subtle are there any recent cases of discrimination among Pacific Islanders that have concerned you look for example with what happened with Pat Lamb recently you know you'd think that he would have been uh, as a sportsman a salmon sports person he would have been held in high regard but it's not until things go wrong that um, public you know uh, reaction like what we saw against him rears its head and then you realize yeah there is still you know uh, racist attitudes out there to what extent is language a barrier we need to have official recognition of Pacific languages in New Zealand so that we can tell our stories um, in um, you know, language that everybody understands. Um, having said that, a lot more New Zealand born people now are living here in New Zealand, but you know, those there are still those language barriers in terms of um, media reporting. How can New Zealand media improve? I think it has to come from the ground up from Māori and Pacific journalists who have to first of all you know, have some sort of cohesive uh, agreement about how they do that. Um, we do have the Pacific Island Media Association and we do need to strengthen um, our relationship you know, with other Pacific media who work in New Zealand. Um, we do need to have more Māori and Pacific representation on organisations like the Broadcasting Standards Authority, um, the New Zealand Press Council, um, and we need more of our you know faces like you, you know, out there in mainstream, um, sort of reinforcing the fact that this is a multicultural country, and that you know there are a multitude of attitudes and cultures to consider. The Pacific Island Media Association is quite excited about the number of Māori and Pacific uh, media outlets that have um, been established. We have Māori television, we have iwi radio uh, and we have newspapers. Uh, we also have the Pacific Media Radio Network, uh, specific magazine. Uh, we have also other TV and radio outlets um, and Tapu Misa who is a columnist for the New Zealand Herald. So uh, we do have a lot of um, highly successful work that's happening out there to get the Pacific media perspectives out there. As an AUT grad student coming out of uni and going straight into covering two of the biggest stories of the year, how was that? Gee, where do I begin? You know, I've covered some really uh, great stories and met some really good people um, during my time with uh, Tangata Pacifica, and uh, one of them being the, um, the Tongan King State Funeral, uh, King Xiao Si Pupo V. Um, that was incredible, you know, seeing um, history and tradition take place in front of my eyes. That was uh, very sudden, unexpected. I was on leave in Australia uh, with my family and, uh, I, you know, I, I had someone uh, tell me, oh, I think the, the Tonga King has passed away. And, you know, in previous years we've had people send texts, oh, the king is dead, you know, but this time we thought, oh, it may be real. And how was that? Oh, it was, it was really scary for me. Um, being a Tongan myself, you know, I understand the, the, the protocols of the tapuness of the, um, you know, covering something like that because, you know, it's um, in Tonga, you know, it's, it's not something you can just rock up and, you know, do a story, okay, you know, but uh, I really enjoyed the cultural as aspect of it. it was really good and um, I, I was also a learning experience for myself as well, so, which is, um, I enjoyed it as well, so it was good. What does it mean to you to be able to offer a 
Polynesian perspective on such a wide scale um, here in New Zealand. Mm. Uh, well, I'm I'm really am honoured, and you know, a medium like the television, you know, we get to uh, expose something like that, like the Tongan King's funeral, because for other um, viewers as well, because they'll never get to see that. And um, you know, we have something in Tonga like the Nimatapu, the Sacred Hands. You know, they, they're the only ones who are allowed to uh, go near the king's body. You know, we got to interview people like that, and nowhere else you'll see anything like that. So to bring that to um, you know, non-Tongans and you know other Pacific people, it's it's great. So what's the difference between media freedom issues in Australasia compared to the Pacific Islands? New Zealand and Australia, of course, are at different developmental levels, and the media plays a, a crucial role in our countries. I guess you could say it plays an even more crucial role in a developing country or in smaller countries like those in the Pacific Islands that we looked at in our, in our Pacific Media Freedom Report last year. We have in, in the Pacific a, a, a range of different um, governmental styles and democracies, but the, the media there see themselves as, as more uh, participants in, in helping that democratic process along. Very different to uh, the situation, say, in New Zealand and Australia, where, where the media is the fourth estate. It, it's holding the government to account, holding truth to power. Now, you have that approach as well in the, in the Pacific, but I guess it's more crucial that the, uh, the, those media organisations uh, carry out a developmental journalism, responsible journalism, which is what's been called for uh, at, at, at media summits and, and media organisations when they get together. How do we address that? Well, I think governments have always got to be held to account and you have to campaign for freedom of the press and, and that has to be a, a, a core institution of, of any society, of, of free media. At the same time, journalists and media organisations need to get on with the job and if that means operating in a system where there is some sort of censorship, well, that's even more admirable in, in the sense that their effort is there to report as best they can and inform the public that they're there. It's not enough to distance yourself and say, well, we're not going to report anymore, we're boycotting this. Is there a greater responsibility for journalists to report on developmental issues in the Pacific? I think so. I, I think in a developing country, a, a journalist and a, and a media organisation, a publication, has to look at the, the main issues that are affecting society and report on them and to do their, their, their core traditional role of bringing about important change. It might be reporting on the Millennium Development Goals, which are important to all Pacific countries, reporting on gender-based violence, or it might be climate change migration that's going on in some places like that. It's important, more important than, say, an already developed country where these issues aren't as important or aren't as... Uh, well, the, the, the danger is not, is not there or affecting people's lives as much. So, yeah, there, there is that responsibility and it needs to be a, a, a core component of, a, of the agenda of a, of a publication in the Pacific.